Uh, you will have noticed, I'm sure, that this country is facing a leadership crisis, not just across government and high institutions like that, but actually across the board. We have terms now that have been made up called things like bare minimum Mondays, which means to ease the stress of a Sunday, you say, I'm only going to do the absolute bare minimum at work on Monday and I'll try and get away as sharp as I can. I don't want to take on any extra responsibility. Quiet quitting, have you heard that one? This whole idea that you don't quit your job, you just do basically bare minimum Mondays, but Monday to Friday. Then you've got conscious unbossing. So the whole idea there is that you never want to become a boss. I, I never want to take on a leadership position. I never want to take responsibility for other people. And I'm making a conscious decision that my whole career will not be shaped by pursuing management positions over other people. And actually, in, for many, this has become kind of virtuous. Like this is a good thing. 72% of Gen Z young professionals said that they would much prefer to do individual upskilling and avoid people management throughout their whole careers. 52% of them said they never want management. 52%. We've got a problem. I'm not surprised though, because the way that leadership has been shaped in this nation and in the West isn't always particularly healthy. It's often goal-orientated about results and bottom lines. It's performance-based. And since the Industrial Revolution and this kind of increasing separation between the home and the workplace, work has become more utilitarian. People can be disposed if they are not meeting the mark anymore. A kind of disposal culture. The refusal of responsibility can seem virtuous in an environment like that. But the answer is not to reject leadership altogether, but to rediscover true leadership. To call men and women to lead like and for Christ in the workplace and in the church and at home and in all sorts of other contexts. The world has always had this perpetual challenge of what it means to follow and what it means to lead. And it's, it's no surprise that then we see even in politics, and I'm sure many of you have been following what's going on with the US election, what happened there, that you end up with a binary choice often between two people that Actually, you don't want to vote for it at all. The world has a leadership problem. Peter, in the next part of our series, in chapter 5, uses a God-given analogy for leadership. One that actually I've been looking to maybe find something that is similar to it, but I've really struggled because there is really nothing like this in the the images of a shepherd. And actually, I still think it is the best image that you can find for leadership and what leadership should look like. Now, in those days, sheep and shepherds were as ubiquitous as mobile phones are today. I mean, you couldn't have turned around a corner or looked up a hill without seeing sheep or without seeing shepherds. It was just part of life. Now, I'm a city boy, okay? Grew up in a suburb outside of Glasgow, lived in Glasgow most of my life. I think I've met maybe like two or three shepherds in my life. Just don't know them. It, it's not part of my life. I, I don't see it, I don't understand it. But I don't think we should abandon the analogy. I don't think we should walk away from what God has given us as this beautiful example of what leadership should be. So we're gonna try and get stuck into it today and try and understand it, are you with me? Right. Um, a big part of this is that shepherds are 
to lead movements. And so I'm going to show us a little video that maybe just gives a little bit of a visual to help us see what those movements might look like. It should be audio. I feel like I should do some commentary or something. <laughs> there it is. There you go. Who knew that sheep moving around could be so beautiful? I was impressed by it. This is what I was doing while I was procrastinating, trying to prepare this sermon. <laughs> Shepherds lead in unison, just as God calls uh, us as leaders within the church and leaders within the world to lead movements of people. And I say us, I don't just mean a chosen few, although we'll look at that, I actually do mean that we should all have influence for Christ. We're all called to make disciples of Jesus. We should all have influence on people around us. Yes, that will change depending on circumstance and character and gifting and all the rest, but we are called to have influence to lead. So if you are sitting here thinking, well, I don't think I'm ever gonna be that kind of leader. I don't think I'm gonna be an elder or a shepherd in the way that you might specifically describe it here in this passage. I do want you to keep in mind that all of us are called to have influence. All of us are called to be people who, for God's sake, are helping people to see him and love him and follow him. And so in that sense, we are all leaders. And in fact, in the church, we should lead one another to Christ. There's a one anothering about the way in which we would do that. All right, Lindsay's going to come read the passage for us. 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. Uh, throughout the Bible, there's countless uh, examples of shepherding. But explicitly, it's spoken of 500 times. And actually, it begins way back in 2200 BC. A shepherd from Ur, a tribe called the Chaldeans, uh, named Abraham, is called out from among that people, and he is called to begin a family. This old man, this old shepherd, and that family would be blessed and he would be the father of a nation who would not only be blessed but would be a blessing to all nations. Then when God calls Moses at the burning bush, Moses has been tending to Jethro's sheep. God calls and leads uh, Moses to be the shepherd who leads the people out of Egypt into the wilderness and on towards the promised land. David later, another shepherd, is called to shepherd God's people. This unlikely shepherd in the field who was forgotten about too young and the one who was not in any way understood to be impressive but had the heart of God was called out to shepherd God's people to be the king. God has always appointed under shepherds. It's his chosen way. But Israel's story as you will know, is full of leadership up and downs. And there are quite a lot of downs. Under shepherds and flocks losing their way. Now, in our Bible reading, you might have noticed this in Judges, there's a pattern to what's going on. There are leaders, Judges, that uh, rise up that God uses in part, um, but the goodness that they bring diminishes again and again and again with the next one that comes. And unfortunately, their leadership is terrible and it gets worse and worse. And what you see repeated is, was that at that time, Israel had no king. Everyone was doing what was right in their own eyes. That's kind of typical 
of the leadership that we see throughout the Old Testament. Ezekiel and Jeremiah sum up their disappointment in Israel's leaders as shepherds who only take care of themselves during the Babylonian exile. Self-interested shepherds, the ones God is not looking to raise up. When Jacob blessed Joseph, Genesis 48, we see something though that is that should encourage us. And that is not that God only calls under shepherds, but of course there is a shepherd who they are answerable to. Jacob blessed Joseph and he said that the same God walked with Abraham and Isaac is the same God who has been my shepherd all my life to this day. He passes on the blessing of being shepherded as God's sheep. That leadership begins with being shepherded by God. That's verse 4, isn't it? And 1 Peter 5. There is a chief shepherd. God has always been the chief shepherd. And more than a thousand years um, after Jacob had blessed Joseph, David penned his biggest hit. The Lord is my shepherd. David wasn't, David wasn't just the shepherd of the people. The Lord is my shepherd. Leaders led the shepherd being shepherded. 700 BC Isaiah says, God tenderly cares for his people like a shepherd cares for his little lambs. We have a God who tenderly cares for us and who is the leader, the one we all should be looking to. And that's where we need to start. And God promises that he will then gather his scattered sheep together and take them home. Micah 2, I will bring them together like sheep in a fold, like a flock in the middle of a pasture. Ezekiel 34, for this is what the sovereign Lord says, I myself will search out for my sheep and seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock when he is among his scattered sheep, so I will seek out my flock. Then, of course, Jesus comes along. Same hills. And he looks out and he sees not just sheep, he sees people. He sees a flock. And he says, you are like sheep without a shepherd. He has compassion on them. He sees them lost and hungry and mucky and thirsty. And he's come because they need a shepherd who would leave the 99 to bring them home, to feed them, to clean them, to quench their thirst. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. Maybe today you're feeling thirsty. Maybe you're feeling mucky. Maybe you just need fed. And maybe you don't know where home is. But Jesus has come to take you home, to feed you, to cleanse you, to quench your thirst. And of course, that means that the best way to become a great leader, the best way in which we can see leadership redeemed is to learn from Christ. Being led by him in the quietness of our hearts over time, to trust him and to allow our inner life to shape our outer life. To not force leadership, but to be led beautifully by him in such a way that we want to lead like him when the opportunity comes. So we've got this great shepherd. That must be the context in which we see the rest of God's commands around leadership and particularly pastor, elder, overseer. And that is what God is looking for in under shepherds. As he establishes the church, as he looks for the kingdom to advance, his chosen way is to take under shepherds, elders, and to call them to lead churches like he leads 
them and the church. He, he wants representatives of him. He's, he's not looking for people to, to kind of make a name for themselves. He's looking for people who want to make a name for him. One of the few shepherds I've met um, invited me to his farm, which was nice. I was 15 years old playing a rugby team. Um, it was like a district team and there was this guy who lived out in the country. Got on really well. I said, look, why don't you come and um, there's a party going on, come for the weekend. All right, I will. And um, he lived on a farm, of course, that's what shepherds do. Um, and uh, he had quad bikes. And he used these quad bikes, yes, for us to have a great time and jump over burns and all that sort of stuff. But also to drive the sheep. And actually the way that shepherds would do it, maybe here in this country today, is that kind of way you get behind the sheep and shepherd the sheep and you've got a dog doing its thing. I don't understand, but they're getting the sheep together. But they really are driving them from behind and pushing them forward. But one of the things you may have noticed in that video is a couple of instances where the shepherds weren't at the back, they were at the front. And actually, in the Middle East, it's always been that shepherds would lead from the front. A pastor tells a story of going out to Israel a few years ago and how he was just watching these shepherds, there was a few of them together, and they were taking uh, these sheep through a gorge and they get to the end of the gorge and he's kind of wondering, what are they going to do? Are they going to keep walking together? Are they going to go in different directions? How are the sheep going to know where to go? And they get to the end of this gorge and the shepherds go in different directions. And at first the sheep look a bit confused and then he starts to hear the shepherds calling. And somehow the sheep knew the call of their shepherd. And they would follow after their shepherd. They know his voice. Just like Jesus says, we will know his voice. And they followed in the right direction. The stunning thing about that kind of leadership is that it is about example. It's about going ahead. It's about doing the things that you're asking others to do. You're not willing to just kind of lord it over people and shout and bark instructions. You want to lead out from the front and invite people to come with you. What a contrast to that kind of pushy, domineering leadership we so often see in the world. Instead of avoiding leadership altogether, this is the kind of leadership that we need to reclaim. Jesus' call to under-shepherds actually began at breakfast. Maybe remember the story. It is supposed to contrast another story, a story about Peter. Peter denied Jesus three times the night he was arrested and betrayed and killed. But here, Jesus says to him three times, feed my sheep. Over breakfast, in relationship, over a conversation, he says, feed my sheep three times. And he's saying, look, by the grace of God, go and lead. Not because you and yourself have all the power and the gifting and the ability, but because I am with you and I'm going ahead of you, because I am making you new, because I am the one who is leading out and I'm choosing you to, to go and take this people and follow after me in the same way that you've seen me lead. That is the kind of call that we're looking for within the church. And that actually leadership in the church should exemplify what leadership in general should look like. Imagine people leading in the world like Jesus led. We want leadership to be so radically different here in the church than the world that people look to the church and go, wow, that is, that is it. You guys are onto something that we're not onto. Something that is better for everyone. Something that is better for all people. Something that will not make people run from leadership, but actually, as they grow and mature, they would become people who, they would become the type of people who go, yeah, do you know what? I'm gonna take on that responsibility because I care about other people, 
not because I want my name and lights. And so leadership needs to be we, not me. Verse 1, Peter addresses elders among you. I always think it's bizarre when churches make appointments by application, interview, and maybe uh, a Sunday where you're preaching with a view. Now, that's not to be over, overly critical of other churches. In some cases, it's just the best they can do in a difficult situation. But actually the ideal is that this would be relational and that it would be able to happen over a breakfast with somebody you already know really well. You're already doing life with them, you already see their character. You know something about them that's more than just about how impressive they can look over a weekend. But it's actually about a life that is dedicated to Jesus. And you can see it because you've seen it day in and day out, week in and week out. The world wants crowd gathering, stock increasing, target smashing, cash grabbing, dynamic leaders. People who actually unfortunately are ready to be cancelled and crushed and discarded at the first mistake. So no matter how impressive they might look, the culture is, well, if you're not continuing to be that impressive, we will just cancel you. No longer useful, let's discard you. But God's not looking for results-driven executives, but love-driven shepherds. God wants loving leaders to move at the speed of relationships, to make disciples via moment-to-moment -moment encounters, faithfully feeding people with the Word of God, pastoring in relationship. That's why the Apostle says, we were delighted to share with you not only the Gospel of God, but our lives as well. Our job is not done when we kind of sit down after we've preached. That's not pastoring. That's a performance. This has to be part of that pastoring, but actually it has to be in deep relationship. It doesn't mean that we will know everyone really well. Too big a church for that. But it does mean that each of us would know kind of what's going on and we'd have different people that we can trust and know that are leading others and that there would be leaders upon leaders, kind of layers of leadership through the church that naturally, organically takes place as people look to care for one another and love one another. And that we would be overseeing that, taking care of that, making sure that people are okay within that, that they are being looked after and that they're being ushered towards more and more of Jesus that they are being guarded from proverbial wolves, that the truth is being proclaimed, that people wouldn't be uh, easily tricked by the world's schemes and its teaching, that they'd speak truth and correct because they love them more than fearing reaction or the hassle of it. Now, I hope it's obvious, but you'll notice that it's elders, not elder, but elders. There's more than one. And they are to hold each other accountable, to do the work together, to follow Christ and his shepherding together. The New, Test New Testament emphasis is togetherness, not one guy, not like a CEO or a president. The guys um, have said to me, look, we would love you to facilitate the team, but the emphasis for us is very much on together. And actually, if the other guys say, and we think you're wrong, then I'm wrong. That's how it works. And Peter, uh, he regards himself here as a fellow elder. Now that's important because he's actually an apostle. And we can kind of confuse things there and make these kind of apostolic figures, people who are seen as a, a ministry that is separated from the local church, where, they're not, where their lives aren't being seen in the everyday. And that they can just kind of tour around churches and do their thing 
and, um, and that they can just then disappear for a while and not be seen and then come back and do their thing at another church. And they kind of become like these, I don't know, marauding big speakers and impressive people that come in for a moment and then disappear. But actually the normative way of the New Testament is, is that apostles would be uh, people who are rooted in churches. And so that's the way that we work here at Glasgow Grace. So we have people that speak into our church. We would call it apostolic ministry. And we try and avoid the word apostle because it gets a little bit confusing and people think it's something it's not. It's simply people coming and helping us and strength, helping us to strengthen us. And uh, by the permission of the church, we're inviting them in and saying, hey, come help us. One um, is Matthew Hosier, who comes regularly uh, from Gateway Church. He's coming again in January with his wife, Grace. We're on the phone to them a lot, asking them advice. We're seeing them next week uh, down in Poole, a bunch of us who are going down for the UK Advanced Conference. And there's a relationship there. But they are very much rooted in their own church and have accountability there. And we know the people in that church. That's the church that sent us to plant this church. Do you see how it's got to be relational? It can't, we must watch ourselves. That we don't allow for leaders to get isolated and to do things their own way without accountability. It's so important that that accountability remains in the church. All right. They are hopefully about we, not me, but also grateful and not begrudging. Peter says, not because you must. Elders should normally love being with God's people. If you have an elder, who is moaning about their role, you got a problem. Because they've got to desire to help the flock, to love the flock. And that's why it is described as a flock, a people brought together to move through life as one, to be on mission together. And so elders are within that group. They are first sheep and then shepherds, and together we're moving forward. So the flock's togetherness actually contrasts Isaiah's prophecy, his warning, we all like sheep have gone astray, each of us has turned to our own way. You see that in the New Testament now, in the gospel, because of what Jesus has done, and because he is our chief shepherd and we're following after him, we now, because Christ has had the iniquity laid on him, that we should have uh, received become one people, united by the suffering servant Isaiah said would come and he came. 700 years after he said those words. So what should mark out the people of God, and certainly it's under shepherds, then is gospel joy. Because what really makes you, you and me, me, is what Christ has done for us. And because of that, we want to passionately point one another to Jesus again and again and again and again. Peter in chapter one um, gives us this amazing example of what this looks like. So what we're looking for in leaders are people who are thankful, grateful. Not people who uh, think, oh, they just, uh, they, you know, like, yeah, I suppose I'm a Christian, but it's more about like, I suppose I can lead people and get things done. We don't want people leading us like that. We want people who genuinely are joyful in the Lord because of what he has done for us. Beginning of Peter, and we see this from Paul in his letters as well, says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ and his great mercy. He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. Praise God, in other words. These men are people who are praising God. They can't help it. It just overflows out of them. They're, they're thankful people. Those are the kind of leaders we want because they have a gospel perspective on the world. It's not fake. Do you see that at the end? 
Though now for a little while you've had to suffer grief and all kinds of trials. By the way, there is no punctuation in the Greek here. This is just like a br one breathless um, sentence of praise. And at the end, he's still real about the circumstances being terrible at times. You might be sitting there with some terrible circumstances going on, but actually there is still gospel joy to be had. And so there's this gospel perspective that we want our leaders to have. Not fake but authentic, bubbling over joy in the Lord. That's because their identity is in him. If their identity was elsewhere, they would be easily affected by criticism. They would be people we wouldn't want to follow. And criticism does come when you lead. We're not looking for cynical leaders. We are looking for joyful, grateful ones. There are also people who give and are not about gain. An elder wants to give, not gain. It's in his heart. Because motivations do matter. You should care about the motivations of the hearts, our hearts, but the hearts of our leaders. They don't look for instant reward and reciprocation. They want a Christ-like leadership model lived out in their own lives and the way that that often works is that they might get quite a lot of complaints coming their way a lot of difficulty coming their way maybe not always being greatly appreciated but they keep loving and they keep serving and they faithfully preach the word of god and they keep caring about you no matter what that's the kind of leadership we're looking for Matthew 5, 12 says, Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Jesus expects this. He expects that actually it will be difficult at times, and he's not only talking about how it can be difficult relationally within the church, he's actually talking about how persecution first comes to leaders. I have a little bit of experience of this. It's, it's tiny, it's nothing. I mean, you go to other parts of the world and you wouldn't want to call what the opposition I've received is persecution. And you will have received certain similar things, maybe in your workplace and sports teams and all that kind of thing as well. But whenever I tell people what I do for a living, you often see people suddenly go, not interested. Just as immediate, you can see it immediately. They want to switch off, not talk to you, and you have to win them back like really earn it. There's not an immediate trust anymore because persecution will increase as culture goes the way it's going. And we're getting a little taste of that now. And actually, if you're putting yourself out there as a leader within the church, you are going to see more of that. We also want leaders that serve, but are not about power. Not about power. It's not another ladder to ascend. If you find yourself insulted that maybe you're someone who's been overlooked for leadership in different ways. Maybe you're someone who has great ambition for uh, leadership. Well, I would just encourage you, please keep checking your heart. Is this another ladder that you think you need to ascend and that you're insulted that you've not been given the opportunity to go up it? Elders lay down crowns. They descend with Christ to the depths of people's despair. They sit with people in their heart. They fight for them in prayer. A Christian is called to die to themselves. That's the way of Christ, but it has to be exemplified in leadership. Jesus gave that famous leadership lesson when the disciples were arguing, you'll probably remember, who is the greatest in Luke 9? But actually it's the verse that follows that story that I think is really important. In the story itself, Jesus says that the one who is least among you is the greatest. You'll be familiar with those words. But the verse that follows embodies that lesson. And there's like a little, um, there's a little title that's been added above it. And sometimes these can be helpful. Sometimes they can be unhelpful because it shows a separation that isn't there you're supposed to see that the next thing that happens is verse 51. As the time approached for him to be taken to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. 
He saw the cross before him. He knew what he had to do and he set out for it. And that is leadership. You lead from the front, willing to die for those around you. Robert Quinn, a leadership professor at the University of Michigan, was reflecting on all the contemporary literature on leadership and he said this, leadership authors do not understand that leadership means go forth to die. If they did understand that they would not be enticed to write about it because people do not want to hear this message. Most people want to be told how to get extraordinary results with minimum risk. They want to know how to get out of the box results with in the box courage. Being a leader in the church is increasingly requiring you to be courageous. If we're fed up with egotistical, self-focused leaders, we need to join this movement of, of people who want to be Christ-like and follow the chief shepherd and then pray for more leaders. Pray for men and women to lead within the church and out there in the world. Pray for men who want to who will hear the call to eldership and lead like Christ. Those who are about we, not me, who are grateful, not begrudging, who want to give and not gain, who seek to serve, not more power. And the Peter then addresses the flock in the last few verses, doesn't he? We all lead in some regard whether we like it or not. We all have influence, right? That influence absolutely increases, decreases according to all kinds of things. But we are all called to make disciples of Jesus. And the greatest joy of any leader in the kingdom of God must be that you are not the king. You're the leader's leader, the shepherd's shepherd, who is equipping the saints for the ministry. In other words, if you think you're called to in verse commas, ministry. Can I just help you with how un unhelpful that term is? Because your real job is not your own ministry. Your real job is to, your real role is to release the church into their ministries. That's what you're called to do when you lead in the church. Identify what is going on in other people's lives and keep releasing them into what God has for them. And so the first thing that we have to kind of deal with here is a word that we don't particularly love, submission. In our culture, we don't know what to do with it, do we? But Jesus said, because his sheep know his voice, we should follow him and we should submit to him. Submit to Jesus, that's easy, but what about church leaders? Of course, elders get things wrong. Let me be clear, this is aspirational. There are certain qualifications that an elder should have, but it's also aspirational in that I, let me be very clear, do not lead like Christ. Not in the fullest sense of that at all. I want to, I'm desiring to, I hope I'm growing in it. And I've got people around me saying, eh, not sure that was so Christ-like. Or, okay, like, I see you growing there. That's great. But we, we must realize that our leaders are not going to be perfect. But we are still called to submit to them as they submit to Christ. And actually, submitting to those leaders doesn't mean that you don't have an opinion. It doesn't mean that you can't come and say, well, what about this? I'm not so sure about this. Can you talk me through this? Why do you believe that? These are important parts of what it means for us to grow together in relationship and be on mission together and follow the chief shepherd together. That's really important. And I'm hoping that you've never had an experience in this church where an elder just kind of shuts you down and says, I don't want to hear it. It's, you know, it's our way or the highway. We want to hear people's voices. We want to talk through things together. But there is a submission that means that the general movement of the church and as we go together that there would be a willingness to follow even when you don't always particularly agree
we find that we become more dependent people who are rejecting a form of individualism to do things together even if we don't always fully agree. And the power of that is really important for how the church grows. And of course, it talks about humility. Now, humility is not thinking less of yourself. It's just thinking of yourself less. You've maybe heard that one before. It's important that we realize that it's not about beating ourselves up. It's not about playing ourselves down. It's about actually realizing who we truly are in God. It's a shift of focus. Humility is believing God, not you or your critics. You and your critics will have all kinds of views that are wrong. But God sees you as you truly are. When we are focused on how we look to everybody else, we can end up with quite an arrogant view of ourselves, or we can end up feeling quite down about ourselves. Both are actually pride because it's a focus on self rather than having a self-forgetfulness about us. That's true humility. So whether you have a five-star review of yourself or a one-star review of yourself, actually we need to get away from that whole way of judging ourselves altogether and look to the way that Jesus sees us, the way that God sees us. 1985, a critic in The Observer wrote of a new musical at the Barbican that it was witless and synthetic entertainment. That musical was criticised by quite a number of critics at the time. And it was felt it wouldn't survive. That musical is Les Mis. It's now the longest running musical in the West End. Some of you are listening to critics, but Jesus is saying, I'm going to take you through to the end. I'm going to give you the crown of life. I see you as my son or my daughter. You are more valued than you can ever begin to imagine. I see the real you. You do not see the real you. Stop relying on your own form of criticism or the criticism of others. The performance that you are giving is not what makes you you. It is what Christ has done for you. It is the way in which God has made you and has redeemed you and will see you through to the end and that you will be his in every way possible, that uh, you uh, are the person that he has made, redeemed, the person that he is his calling to be, everything that uh, he has designed for eternity. He sees that. Clothe yourselves in humility, Peter says. Like the humble shepherds who wrapped garments around them, shepherd's garments, that would have stank of sheep and all the other bits that come with that. We are to wrap ourselves in humility, to put ourselves in each other's lives. Someone falls in muck, we should be willing to lend a hand and get ourselves mucky too, because that is what submission and humility does for you. It means that you start to see others how Christ sees them. You see God's potential. You see image bearers who have always, even if they don't know Jesus yet, the potential of redemption and the fullness of that person to be restored. We see people like God when we're humble. We don't want to reject leadership but rediscover and call men and women to Christ-like leadership in the church and the world, and particularly to call men to eldership. 